It's a joy to be back at uh, Brewster Baptist Church. Uh, you're a unique church. I think you know that. And that's because of the people. The church means the people of God. And you are the people of God. And I never go anywhere without telling people about your remarkable congregation because, Doug, you got that up high enough? So, okay. <laughs> now, if my father were here, you would hear him. He would be really blasted out. Uh, but Pastor Doug and his wife, Jill, always are telling me wonderful stories whenever I'm calling them and, and uh, they tell me about what's going on. And it's really, really exciting to, to know that this church is such a, a caring church. I mean, and it starts uh, like with Maryland today. You care about the people who are members of this church. I think that's one of the great things. I think that's why people love being a part of this fellowship because they know there are people here who really do care about them and love them. And this church reaches out not simply to those who are the members and attend this church, but out into the community. And when I hear the kinds of stories that this church, the the things that you have performed, the deeds of kindness out here, and then on beyond, out into the world of mission and the significant place you hold in the American Baptist churches. It is simply incredible, it really is. So it's very special for me to be here today and to be able to share some time with you. I received a phone call from some longtime friends of mine. We've been friends for over 50 years, in fact, uh, uh, he was a student at the Harvard Medical School, and he became one of the nation's leading physicians. And his wife called me several weeks ago, and I've been in touch with him and her throughout these past couple of weeks, because as she said to me on the phone, he is dying of cancer. And she added, life is hard. And that's why we come to worship God. That's why we come here to this faith community. We come here because we know that God will listen to us, that God cares for us, that God loves us. And that's what I hear in this wonderful scripture. I think in many ways that this scripture I'm gonna to read to you now from the message from Thessalonians, it, it speaks to this church. I think that Paul's words are meant for you here today. And I hope that you will agree when we get through. The scripture says, I, Paul, together here with Silas and Timothy, send greetings to the church at Thessalonica, Christians assembled by God the Father and by the Master Jesus Christ. God's amazing grace be with you, God's robust peace. Every time we think of you, we thank God for you. Day and night you're in our prayers as we call to mind your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope in following our master Jesus Christ before God our Father. It is clear to us, friends, that God not only loves you very much, but also has put his hands on you for something special. When the message we preach came to you, it wasn't just words, something happened to you. The Holy Spirit put steel in your convictions. You paid careful attention to the way we lived among you and determined to live that way yourselves. In imitating us, you imitated the master. Although great trouble accompanied the word, you were able to take great joy from the Holy Spirit, taking the trouble with joy, the joy with trouble. Do you not know that all over the provinces of both Macedonia and Achaia, believers look up to you. The word has gotten around. Your lives are echoing the master's word, not only in the provinces, but all over the place. The news of your faith in God is out. We don't even have to say anything anymore. You're the message. People come up and tell us how you received us with open arms, how you desired how you deserted the dead idols of your old life so you could embrace and serve God. They marvel at how expectantly you awaited the arrival of his son whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescued us from certain doom.
The Apostle Paul, Silas and Timothy, the three apostles, headed north of Athens to the northernmost tip of the Aegean Sea to the city of Thessalonica in Macedonia. The city was cosmopolitan. It was composed of Macedonians, Romans, and Jews. The evangelism team came there and shared the word and set an example. And because of that, they won converts, established a church, and then they left the city. The Apostle Paul desired sometime later to go back to Thessalonica, but his duties and distance prohibited. And so Timothy, he made that return trip and sent a report to Paul. And Paul in turn wrote this first letter to the Thessalonians on behalf of the three apostles. This is a wonderful text that we have here and it's an inspirational text that is, uh, is really great and I think and I hope that you will take it to mind because in it is encapsulated, if you will, the four Christian agreements that Paul speaks about in this first chapter. And the first thing that he speaks about is faith, the work of faith. And he marvels at that work of faith. He said that you became steadfast in faith because this faith was born out of a relationship with Jesus as Lord. It was born out of a relationship with Jesus as Lord. In our own time, we have a person who has defined faith for us. His name is Carl Jung, a psychiatrist. And he said that faith is one of the forces by which people live. Now, that does not mean that we simply, that faith is simply saying, I have faith. Faith is not something just of the mind. The word is not simply a word. It is much more than that. It is something that is dynamic. It is something that pushes out and reaches out in terms of love and acts of human kindness to help other people. That is what faith is really all about. And it comes about because when we meet Jesus, when we have a relationship with Jesus, our lives change. And that change can be visually observed by us. It was Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount, in the seventh chapter and the 16th verse, who said, they will know you by your fruits. That is to say that by, the, by how we speak, and what we do and the way we act will tell something about who we really are. The way, Jesus defines that even more specifically in the Gospel of John in the 14th chapter in verse six when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Let us quickly look at a few people who have given us a word about faith and one of them is Saint Augustine. And he said, God has no one but us. God without us will not. We without God cannot. And another great spiritual leader from India, he was a singular person during the last century. His name was Mahatma Gandhi and what he was a powerful influence upon Martin Luther King Jr. And he said of faith that it is grasped not by the brain but by the heart. And that is true, that the spirit of the living Christ, when it comes into our heart, it changes us, at least in two ways, in terms of our character and our conduct. And then there was Mother Teresa who won the Peace Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979. And she took it a step further when she said, we must be his hands. We must be his hands. And then she told this kind of simple little everyday story that occurred for her. She knew of a Hindu family that hadn't eaten for days and so she came with a bit of rice for them. And she no sooner got in the house when the mother divided it, was out the door before Mother Teresa could say anything and then came back in because she had gone next door to a Muslim neighbor to give that family some of the rice. And Mother Teresa said, what, what have you done? How are you going to be able to feed your family? There are 10 of you with this little bit of rice. 
And the woman said, they were hungry too. They were hungry too. Charles Dickens, the great social critic and playwright in England during the 19th century, said that no one is useless in this world who lightens the burden of another. I close this first section on faith by turning to D.L. Moody, who was the founder of the school I attended, Mon Hermon School, and he defined faith in this way, which you can't forget if you've never heard it before. Faith is of the head, the heart, and the hand, that we should love the Lord our God with all of our mind, with all of our heart, and our hands should be reaching out in acts of love and human kindness. Sometimes all we really need is to reach out to someone's hand and a heart to understand. Next, Paul commends them for their labor of love. Love is hard. Love is difficult. You have a list of difficult people in your life, right? We all have that list. And start putting those names down as I suggest some areas. One is some people are difficult who just touch the fringe of our life just on rare occasions or very seldom. And then there are people that we meet in our everyday life, whatever that might be, whether it's our work or our volunteer work, whatever it is, we see those people. And sometimes they're difficult people in church. In church? Are there, really, are there any difficult people? I can't imagine that. And they're difficult people who are friends and family, especially family. Right? Now, I got a few affirmations. You know what I'm talking about. Difficulty. There are people who are difficult in life. However, we are Christians and therefore we are called upon to love each and every one of them because God <clears throat> is love. And a quintessential element of Christianity is that of love. I received a call from upstate New York several weeks ago. A young Christian layman wanted to know more about merging churches. He had heard that I had earlier written a book on merging churches, but the essential question that he asked me, the most important question, he saved for last. And he said, may I ask you a personal question for my own life? I said, of course. And he said, what is the most important thing that you can tell me for my life? I said, love more, love better. I think Pastor Doug has told some of you I've initiated a five-year plan. In a couple of weeks, I'll be 85, so I'm looking at a 85 to 90. I'm a young man today in this congregation, all right? <laughs> if you haven't put your five-year plan to work yet, you start writing it up, okay? And at the top of the list is to love my family better. Boy, I mean, Jill was just great, the meals that she prayed prayer for me the last couple of days. I'm, I'm grateful how you, how you have to love people like that who are, take good, good care of you, and she takes good care of me. So that's at the top of my list. And loving friends, being in touch with them, write them a letter, call them on the phone, call someone today that you haven't talked to for a long time. Just tell them how much you appreciate them, what they've meant to you in your life. And then, of course, healing broken relationship, mending those relationships. I got a couple, and I'm trying to work on them, and I'm going to work on them to the best of my ability. And then Part of the other five year, part of that five year plan is I'm trying to read books that I haven't had a chance to read or didn't take the time to read. One of them I know many of you have read this book, but I just read it about a month or so ago, and uh, it's called How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> what a time to start reading a book like that <laughs> by Dale Carnegie. I should have read it a long time ago. It would have helped. I would have, I, hey, I would have, wouldn't have had some of the problems I had, I'm sure. And in the book, he shares a story that I want to share with you today. Uh, one of his men was in his class, and he told the, in his class the story of the fact that his wife belonged to a self-improvement group at her church. And she had come home and, and said to her husband, I, I really would like you to help me out in this self-improvement. I want to be a better person. And so she said, what I'd like you to do for me is tell me six things I could change to make our marriage better for you. <laughs> now, <laughs> of course you've asked that question, right? 
And, and he, he said, he was kind of surprised to have gotten that question. But as he thought about it, he thought, you know, it would be pretty easy to name six things I could tell her. But then there are probably a thousand things she could tell me that I should change to help her. So he thought better of it, and he said, I'll, I'll speak to you in the morning. So the next morning, he got up early, and he called a florist, and he said, send my wife a half dozen of your best roses and put this note inside, which says, I wouldn't change one thing about you. I love you just as you are. Now, just imagine what happened when he came home that night. Who greeted him at the door with practically tears in her eyes? And when she went back to her group at church on Sunday and she told her group what her husband had done, guess how those women in her group felt and how they greeted him when they saw him. Do you have a spouse like that? I hope you do. Now, don't lose out on doing something helpful. And I'm going to tell you, you can start right now. You can turn to the person you love next to you and you tell them, I love you. Give them a good kiss or squeeze their hand if you're embarrassed by that kiss. Go ahead. The other people did it. And the other, come on now. Give them, give, them a, give them a good hug or a kiss. There, okay. Love is what makes the world go round. Yeah. Don't let opportunity pass you by. Some people have, like Thomas Carlyle the great essayist and historian, a favorite of my father's. And uh, his wife was so devoted to Thomas Carlyle. And unfortunately, he was not as solicitous to her as he should have been. And after she died, he was going through some of her papers. And there he found a heart-wrenching note that had been secretly penned by her, in which she said, how much it would have meant if he had thought to give her a little bit of praise on a daily basis. Belatedly, Carlyle went to her grave with tears in his eyes saying, Jane, if I had only known, if I had only known. Don't let time pass you by. As we close out this section on love, I want to go from the cemetery to the obituary pages of the Wall Street Journal. So some of you in this you we'll probably read the Wall Street Journal and the obituaries, and you know there are some great ones there. You learn a lot about people. And last October, I think it was, I, I read one that I said, this is so good, I've got to clip this one. Howard Ruff, 1931, 2016. And he's a businessman. I didn't know anything about him until I read this obituary. But there was a line in it that caught my attention because he said he never failed to tell people what enabled him to have such a successful marriage. He told everyone about his wife and, and he and what a great marriage they had. And he said, it's because we both loved the same man. <laughs> I, I, knew, I knew the women would get that. <laughs> the labor of love. Keep it in your heart, and as long as you keep the love of Jesus Christ in your heart, you're going to keep your life and your relationships alive. Next, Paul turns to hope. Hope is so important in our lives. He talked about the patience of hope. We should be patient. Be patient with people. Uh, we should learn, if you will, to hold on, to hang in there, to stay the course, to have endurance. Pastor Doug preached, preached a great sermon on the first Sunday of March. I, every week, I critique him, so he's going to critique me today. You know, it's, 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 it's part of it. Father and son do this stuff. And on that Sunday, that was, every Sunday, he has a great sermon. But that Sunday, I really touched me with that scripture on that Sunday, which says that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And our hope does not disappoint us because of the love of Jesus Christ. The patience of hope. I have a young man in the group that I lead at the church that I serve out in, as a layperson in uh, Seattle. And this young man, he's 50 years of age. Anyone under 70 is a young person to me. <laughs> and he's 50 years of age. And 
he wrote a note, a uh, letter to his family. And I asked him, it was such a powerful note for me, I asked him, I said, would you give me permission to share it in a sermon that I'm gonna be preaching in Brewster? And he said, yes. And so I want you to listen very carefully because you're listening to intimate words written by a father and by a husband to his wife and several children, okay? Our family has a problem. I realized a long time ago that it is a waste of time to try and figure out what caused the problem. If we tried, we would all disagree. But the effects are obvious. Good people who should love each other haven't spoken to one another for years and all carry scars from the broken relationships. I don't suppose that any of you think of yourselves as part of the problem, but if you're not part of the solution, then you are part of the problem. So I've been praying about how I could encourage all of us to join in becoming part of the solution. I'm not very good at that, but hopefully God can speak to you through or in spite of what I say. Some have said that a possible solution might be to just wait it out, that eventually we will learn to accept one another again. If only we just wait for healing to happen. That would be a delightful idea if it worked, but I have not seen any evidence that it works, and neither have any of you. If anything, we have all seen very vividly examples of how that doesn't work. The Bible says that if your brother or sister has something against you, you must leave your gift at the altar and go to be reconciled. We cannot love God who we have not seen unless we love our brother or sister who we have seen. Matthew 5, 23, 24. Pastor Doug made a similar reference in our worship today. And then he concludes the letter by saying, I have also heard it suggested that if the problem exist because one of us was evil enough to warrant decision, then to some extent they deserve it. And it's okay to maintain the status quo, no matter how sick it may seem. But that doesn't work either. We have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. God loves every one of us anyway. And God calls us to love one another anyway. And finally, as you know, I have tried for the last nine years to be part of the solution, and I have been surprisingly ineffective. I'm going to give you a chance to tell me what can be done and what steps you will take. God does work miracles, but he almost always uses people to do them. I'm not pretending that this will be an easy path, but the longer we wait, the harder it will be. It has already been too long. I love you all and will be praying for you. The patience of hope, nine years and counting. Hope is the most durable power in the world. I close this section on hope by sharing some words from a great Christian, John Bunyan of Bedford, England, who spent two decades in prison because of his fight for religious liberty, a great Baptist, early Baptist leader. And while he wrote that story, this is a magnificent uh, kind of a dream episode uh, with figures in it that tell us something about the human condition today. These symbolic figures tell us about the human condition today. So let me just share this one little slice of the story, one little episode. Christian is on his way, on the road, on the way to the celestial pa palace. And he's accompanied by hopeful. And the journey is hard, it's not an easy journey. The way is a difficult path. But he looks over across the fence and he sees this nice grass and vain confidence, a man striding right along. And he says, why should we be 
walking this difficult path when right over here is an easy path going the same way. And so he says to Hopeful, let's go. And over the fence they go, and they start following vain confidence. And they follow him all day long until it's dusk and just about nighttime, and vain confidence falls into a pit, and his body is just smashed to bits. And it's at that moment that Christian says, whoop, we've, we, we're on the wrong road. We've got to get back on the road, on the way. But they were tired. It was late. They needed to rest. And so he said, let's just rest here until morning and then we will find the way. They're rudely awakened in the morning by giant despair who says, what are you doing on my property? Takes him in and throws him into doubtful castle. His wife diffident says to giant despair, beat those guys to within an inch of their life, which he does. And they're practically destroyed, but they're still living. So she says, Tell them to commit suicide. That's better than what they have now. And they're brought to the edge. They're at the end of their rope. They're in despair. It's the dark night of the soul. But Hopeful says, we need to exercise a little more patience. The patience of hope and prayer. And suddenly, Christian realizes, what have I done? This is crazy what I'm doing. Right here in my pocket over my heart is the key of promise that can unlock the doors to Doubtful Castle and the fence around it that have locked us in and we can gain our freedom and they do as they head back to find the road and the way. And of course you can see what the story is all about. It tells us first of all that we should stay on the road, the way, even when it is difficult. And second, we should always travel with hopeful. We should always travel with hopeful. No matter how bad, how difficult, how hard things may get, never, never, ever give up hope. Always maintain it. The patience of hope. Don't leave home without it. <laughs> and lastly, Paul turns to these final words to the Thessalonians. He says that great trouble accompanied the word. Great trouble accompanied the word. And yet, in spite of that great trouble, you took it with joy or with grace. What a tremendous thing when you're able to take joy and uh, take the pain and trouble and suffering with joy and with grace. And we are called upon to do that. Think of a situation you're in where it's very hard, very challenging, very hurtful, where some people who spoke to me in the last service who just had a significant loss in their life and it was very hurtful. And there are kind of two things that we look for. One, we believe there must be some reason for what has taken place in our life, right? And the second thing we look for is, is there any meaning in this? One of the great books that was ever written was called The Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And he was a, considered one of the greatest 100 people of the 20th century. And he was a psychiatrist. And a person came to see him. The man was a general practitioner. And he said to Frankl, I need your help. Uh, is there something you can do to help me? My wife died two years ago. And I'm still in despair. I'm still despondent. The black cloud hovers over my head. What could Frankel tell him? What should Frankel tell him? What would you and I who have had experiences like this tell him? Victor Frankel confronted him with a question. He said to him, what if it was you who had died rather than your wife and she was left to survive you? Oh, he said, that would, that, that would be terrible. It would have been too hard on her. There would have been so much suffering for her. And Frankel said, you see? You see? You gave her a gift. It is you who has had to survive and to deal with the pain and the hurt and the loss and not your wife. You've given her 
a gift. And the man stood up, shook Frankel's hand, and left his office. For, as you can see, suffering is no longer suffering when we find meaning in it. For some people, it takes longer than others. But when we find the meaning in the hurt and pain of our life, our attitude changes, and we re-enter life once again. And I say that to you even for those of us who are in our old age, and maybe for many of us who are in our old age. Trouble is a trust. Pastor Doug said it so beautifully in that March sermon, that first Sunday in March. We can grow through what we go through. Yeah, we can decide, you know, we, we, we can't avoid suffering, but we do have a choice. And that choice is, will we be embittered by it or ennobled by it? Taking trouble with joy or grace. The poet said it well. It's not the fact that you're hurt that counts, but only how did you take it? Let us pray. Our God, help us to apply these four Christian agreements in our life this week that we will be people of faith and of love and of hope, and we will take trouble with joy and with grace because we know that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is with us, will never leave us, and that God blesses each and every one of us. May his blessing be with you this day. Amen.